And now, on with the show. Hello, 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 and welcome to another exciting episode of Film Fracas. I am Ravi DeShazer. With me, as always, is Phoenix Frying My Best Zarola. Hey, shout out. Uh, Brett The Rock Johnson. Happy to be here. And Carter The Sparkling Iceman Cometh Spilliards. I'm not here. No, he's not. Oh, shit, it's just three of us. Oh, no. Well, that's the episode. Okay, well. <laughs> All right. I guess there's only three movies left. Yeah. <laughs> there's only Looks right. like two are no, short no, wait. next time. Wait. An <laughs> automatic disqualification for Carter Spilliards. Absent. This, this was not <laughs> talked about. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, speaking of talked about, we're going to talk about some movies Ooh, yes. right now. In our most thoroughly researched episode of <laughs> the season. Probably. Never uh, felt more prepared for an episode than I do right now. Absolutely. We're going to see if, maybe if a prepped episode actually works better. We'll see. But today, we're talking scores. Yes, we are. We got are. our final four, and we're talking scores. And not, not points. Music. Final so scores. Music. With, with final the four. Notes, the elite four. The rhythms. That's all the fours that I got. Fantastic Four. The Fantastic Four. Rhythms, it's notes, true. instruments. What? Keep going. <laughs> oh, you're in the, <laughs> because Car- of the Car- score. Carter's not talking about Sheet fours. music. Oh, okay. Treble clef. Bass clef. Yeah. Keep going. Please don't. Yeah. What's well, uh, <laughs> okay, well, yeah, I hate to end that Composers. riveting bit. So, but, uh, uh, we're so, going to be talking... Yeah. A real in depth on some scores that some of you guys may not have listened we'll to. We'll be talking about scores. And I know what you're thinking, listener. You're thinking, but film practice, you eliminated all of the movies that have really iconic and known scores. And to that, I say, yeah, we did. We really did. <laughs> that's how. Yeah, that's, so that's how it played but out. And that's, that's what we exactly. These scores, yeah. I was not expecting. They're all good. Yeah. yeah, there's not yeah, a bad one on the list. And, and, you, and you said they're not worth talking about earlier. I... <laughs> After you've been talking about doing scores since before we started doing well, this podcast. You know what? He was disheartened because there's no La La Land, yes. no Lord of the Rings, was, no. no Indiana Jones. Then I actually listened to them and I was like, no, these are good. So well, yeah, yeah, they're, 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 yeah, they're not bad. They're all good. They're not bad. They're all good. No one loses. Let's go home. Nope. Uh, One, someone loses. Oh, yeah, someone, someone always someone loses. Oh, no. This is some practice. Uh, vote. <laughs> um, so but, uh, we're going to be talking in depth on some scores that you guys may not have, you know, intently listened to. So we will be linking to a Spotify playlist yes. with all four of these scores. Please go and mm-hmm. listen to them. So you guys can listen along to them. We'll probably name drop a couple of specific tracks. Uh, Maybe. You know. But yeah, the movies we got left are Who Framed Roger Rabbit, The Princess Bride, The Silence of the Lambs, and RoboCop. And, we're, yeah, we're going to start talking we're scores. Gonna, we're going to frack us. Yeah, does anyone want to start off? I do not want to start off. <laughs> I also don't want to start off. <laughs> Carter, uh, you want to just... Uh, <laughs> you can go. Okay, yeah. All right, let's, let's we'll play We'll go the in the order of the Spotify play. Let's do it. Okay. So, uh, for the first, yeah, we'll go in that order. That's perfect. Um, so, th- my film is Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and... Damn, it's such a good score. I, I turned it on to listen to it and, you know, really get it, you know, get my notes taken down. And it's so good. It's so, you know, you don't think of it being super iconic, but really, like, it's got some great stuff to it. Um, it's composed by uh, Alan Silvestri of Back to the Future, Predator, Forrest Gump, uh, The Avengers, and Ready Player One, which comes out pretty soon or will be out by, the time, this po- by the time this podcast <laughs> comes out. The list goes on and on, though. It's performed by the London Symphony Orchestra, and just to give it some points to get ahead before we even get into it, nominated for the Grammy Award for Best Soundtrack for Visual Media, and won the BMI Film Music Award the year it was released. Uh, This score altogether takes a lot of inspiration from cartoons, I mean obviously because it is Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and especially the works of Carl W. Stalling, who is a very famous cartoon composer. Uh, He composed many, many cartoon films for uh, Warner Brothers specifically and but it also takes uh, a lot of notes from noir films obviously and even you know the more contemporary scores of the 1980s uh, and jazz there's a lot of jazz in this <laughs> score um, I also oh, think that there's a lot of influences from like more orchestral cartoon pieces like Fantasia and stuff they're you know just the way that the visuals are timed to these kind of grand orchestral climaxes at moments, and we'll get into it. But 
uh, we'll get into kind of some of my standout tracks on the on the soundtrack and talk about you know why I like him. Uh, there's Maroon Cartoon, which is from the beginning of the film, and it's the you know the track that goes all the way through a Roger Rabbit and uh, Baby Herman cartoon, and so it just does an amazing job of replicating the sounds of Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies and stuff like that. Um, once again, really takes from Carl W. Stalling. Um, it's, uh, which is, you know, a great feat in and of itself to be able to compose an entire short film's score is as a part of the score for an entire film. There's other great tracks like Valiant and Valiant, which is when Eddie's looking at the pictures of his brother, <laughs> kind of your introduction to him. Uh, it's, it has this one repetitive jazz section in it that I love that reminds me a lot of Twin Peaks. And even though I know Twin Peaks was not out by the t- had not existed when this film came out, so it probably is just based in noir and based in jazz, it had a real Twin Peaksy vibe going to it. I loved it. Uh, Valiant, Valiant, good track. Um, Jessica's uh, theme, I want to talk about that a lot too. Uh, totally improvised by the London Symphony Orchestra which just adds to the incredible jazz tones of this film. Uh, but it also has, you know, these, br- this, these bits of bright instrumentation that still give it a cartoonish feel without being too silly. Um, there's also so many, like, featured songs, like uh, Jessica Rabbit's rendition of Why Don't You Do Right, which is kind of a blues, jazz uh, crossover standard. And it's, so, it's sung so beautifully by Amy Irving. And it is a cover of an already existing song, so you guys can take that how you want to. But I think it was chosen for very specific reasons. Uh, And it's just got a lot going for it. Um, The last thing I want to talk about, I guess there's two more songs. The Gag Factory, which just has a great final confrontation to it. It takes a lot from, you know, the the grand final battle uh, scores of, like, John Williams and some of, you know, Sylvester's contemporaries. And the end title, which I think is so important to this film because it really does take the best points from the rest of the score and really put them all together in kind of an overture type way. Uh, really showcases the entire film. And it really ties the film together and just sums up, sums up how fun the entire ride was. So that's kind of my just overview of the Roger Rabbit score. What do you guys have to say about it? it sounds like you said everything about it. I tried to. I um. You can see my notes on my screen. Which I'll I'm, say I... Of all of the scores we were going into, I didn't really remember... Like, I had the least amount of recollection on this one. Mm-hmm. And I started listening to it, and I was like, damn, this is good. It's such a good score. It's it's so unsuspecting. Um, I love the jazz influence throughout. I love, like, the recurring, like, cartoon motifs even in the jazz. Mm-hmm. And I think when you were talking about, like, kind of harkening back to, you know cartoon music that it it really is just kind of yeah in that way of you you see like old Lenny tunes and stuff with, with that kind of orchestral yeah. music and they're bringing it in with the movie and so it all kind very of very bright brass really well. instrumentation yeah, bright. and a lot of piccolos and flutes yeah the through. only yeah um i thoroughly enjoyed this score um the only perhaps qualm i guess with it um out of the four we've got it's the only one from which i don't think there's necessarily a clear theme to hum or something like 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 a recurring theme that you're like oh yeah that's you know the roger rabbit music like you hear it and you're like oh yeah that's what it is and it's all very good there's just not like the one thing that sticks in your head that you're like oh yeah i know that so i will say listening to it all day the song out of all the scores the songs that has been stuck in my head all day was why don't you do right yeah but that may be because it's not necessarily composed for this film but it's a real catchy blues jazz song so yeah um, there's one thing that I didn't notice until like listening to these scores, mm-hmm. um, and it actually goes into the Princess Bride, but we'll touch on the Princess Bride later. But both of those movies, um, I would say, in terms of the music, a lot of it is trying to um, kind of pay homage to like the genre that it is, or like the movies and stories that kind of influence what it is. Because both of those movies are not necessarily, I mean. I guess satirical is a, is a, like a decent enough word. They kind of play on the tropes of the genre that they're playing in, and I feel like you can see that in the score. Like in Foo Frame Roger Rabbit, you could it's the cartoon influence and the cartoon sounds or the cartoon music is there definitely. The noir music is there definitely, and it's uh, 
it's throughout the whole thing, um, throughout the whole movie, um, which is what the movie or which is what the movie itself is like. And I think in that sense, it fits the movie. Like it fits the movie well. Mm-hmm. I will say that because of that, sometimes, and again, this also would apply to Princess Bride, but we'll get into that. But sometimes in Foo Frame Draws a Rabbit, I can kind of feel like it doesn't feel so like original or not original but like it doesn't feel passioned by one but more like trying to replicate other types of music and i think that's where it kind of and i think that's more to your point of like it's one of those it's hard to hum because it it's not very distinctive it's more just mm-hmm. trying to replicate right um which is not necessarily bad because that's also what the movie does the movie and so, so i'm a little torn on that but i would be um I wouldn't feel right if I didn't say that. Yeah, I I absolutely agree. There's points where it's like the Maroon cartoon theme is very much supposed to be, you know, the Looney Tunes or Warner Brothers theme. Right. But it's just a little bit different. And because of that, you can't quite picture it in your head. You can definitely think, you know, you can think of what it's inspired by. But I will say that that is one of the weaker points. Exactly. Is it tries too hard to replicate something it's not. Yeah, I'm going to bounce off of Phoenix there. Uh, Yeah, it's just kind of like it. This is the one Oddly enough, this is the one part of this movie that I feel like doesn't do as strong a job as combining like the cartoon and noir elements as everything else that we've talked about. Just because, like Phoenix says, it's like doing so much to like replicate so much that it kind of mm-hmm. doesn't. And like, yeah, it, it's all great. The jazz is great. the The noir tunes are great. The cartoon tunes are great. Like, it's all like it's all good, but it's just it doesn't. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's weird. I don't know quite how to word it, but it just it doesn't do enough to like become like its own Roger Rabbit kind of thing because you get the maroon cartoon stuff at the beginning, and just sitting there listening to the score, I was kind of like, oh, like this is like yeah, this is great, like Stallings, like very reminiscent of that. But then like it, and then it's kind of like yeah, you get kind of like cartoony themes and homages throughout, but you never get anything that's like as like as big as that throughout. And then like. The noir stuff sounds pretty, like, just kind of, like, your typical noir music. And so just sitting there, I was kind of like, oh, like, the noir music. Oh, the jazz. Oh, like, kind of cartoony, but not as cartoony as, like, kind of, like, the rest of the movie kind of is. And so it's just kind of like, I feel like it's it's just trying to do so much that it's, like, it's not bloated and it's not overstuffed. But it's just, it's trying to do so much with the music that it kind of, like kind of like shoots itself in the toe a little bit not in the foot itself but yeah that's what in, I would in the toe a little that's what where I would disagree with you I think that the instrumentation and the choice of how they compose those instruments and put and arrange them is so that you know even the stuff that is more you know standard noir uh you know composition is played and accented with different you know more cartoony instruments and stuff like that I that's that's what I really caught from it especially with the blending of those elements. Yeah. I see what you're saying, but I think that's, I think we differ on how much that affects yeah. the. And one thing oh, I will um, say is like, um, the, the music I think is like, like we said at the top, it's good. There's not a bad score in this mm-hmm. list. I believe I really am into the music, um, of this movie and it's very fun. And, you know, um, like listening through it, I was like listening through it throughout my day to day. It was like you kind of like got in like a peppy, like fun mode or whatever. Because I think what Alan Silvestri does in terms of what the movie wants to do, I think he does pretty well. I don't, I mean, I know Brett kind of just dis- like it's challenging that. Um, I think he does a pretty good job, uh, in terms of what in terms of capturing those influences. I do, I think we do agree though that it can lose distinction a little because. Sometimes you hear the music and you don't think, oh, this is Roger Rabbit music. You think, oh, this is music that sounds like X or whatever. And I think that would be its only small problem. I think, um, but besides that, the music's good. I really enjoy the Dueling Pianos track The Dueling Pianos is so good. Dueling Pianos is great. Um, Jessica's theme is also pretty great as well. I know you touched on that. Yeah. Well, I just love how, like, it. when I was reading up on it, like, it's totally improvised. And which is so super impressive. I did yeah, not know that. Which I love about that. So, I don't know. I think I think we know kind of where its strengths are. I think we know where its weaknesses are. Do we want to move on to our next score on the list? Yeah. Sounds Silence good. of the Lambs. Sa- Silence of the Lambs. And you know what? The Lambs may be silent, 
but this score is not. Hey, let's fucking go. All right. So, so I was Do you want to retry was, that joke? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it didn't land as best as I wanted it to, but it's fine. Silence of the Lambs, uh, music composed by Howard Shore, who is eclectic and well-known and very versatile. He's in a lot of David Cronenberg movies, which I love. He's in, uh, or composed, he composed a lot of David Cronenberg movies. Um, he composed The Lord of the Rings, which is actually another movie that we're not talking about, but but that's pretty fantastic <laughs> as well. Um, he composed a few David Fincher movies. He's, he's a prominent dude. And I think what he does well with the set score is um on like he does well in creating atmosphere i think this is a perfect example of a score that underscores the entire film it's a lot of the a lot of the tracks are very atmospheric they kind of uh you kind of feel it in the breathing of the scenes um everything is so chilling and methodical and just unnerving just like the the movie is like the tone is set i think one thing the score really nails is tone for the film um it is just like unnerving the synthesizer goes on throughout almost the entirety of the film one thing listening through the score there's hardly ever any kind of positive or light like lighthearted parts of the movie because the movie itself is so dark and so lack of hope and of goodness and i think that's what's i think that's a strength of the score the score really does feel like it matches tonally with what the script is going for and i think if it just exact uh not exaggerates but amplifies that and i think um even in doing so and even though it can feel um just unnerving and kind of constant i think there's a few little like bright moments um for example um i i, I like to highlight the clarice theme or whatever um that theme is very uh i think the the when you hear it throughout the score i think it's those small moments where you do feel a little bit of hope her her theme of like bah, 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 or whatever it's like a it's like just a small piece of melody but it's like some of the more hopeful and like kind of like uh more positive notes in the entire track and it just gets played out more and more um the lector and memphis and lector escapes tracks are when this unnerving kind of chilling score gets like up to 10 and starts becoming more dangerous and ramps up even more. It gets very scary and intense. Um, and I think that's when you start seeing like when Howard Shore starts to play with, um, you know, increasing tension and scare and stuff into his music. And, uh, and then just like the, the whole cellar and the finale, I think the cellar scene uh, or the cellar track is so different because it start it loses the synthesizer and it becomes like little notes and it just it um, it touches you and makes you feel very um, uncomfortable and weird just how like Clarice is in the actual cellar when she's trying to escape from Buffalo Bill and yeah there's not really much more I want to say about this score or that I without repeating myself I just think it's such a master class of um, you know, taking the content of something and finding its strength and then really amplifying and um, making it even better than it can be without, it doesn't necessarily like showboat or it's not necessarily as flashy or, or whatever, but it definitely nails tone and nails atmosphere and it strengthens the movie de without a doubt. I think um, the best word to describe this score is haunting. Exactly. It's... Mm -hmm. I think purely if we're, you know, not factoring anything else besides, you know, musical composition, comparatively, I think this is perhaps the most well-composed score, I think, in terms of, like, if you're looking at the orchestral music from film to film to film. I think it's, it's like I said, it's hauntingly beautiful, and it stays with you. It creates mood, which is, like, what, you know, the point of the score is. Because, yes, it can kind of fade into the background, maybe while you're, you know, watching the movie. But a score in a movie itself, if you think about the role of the score, is not to, you know, stand out. It's not for you to go, oh, I like that part of the music. It's really the best scores are the ones that do kind of fade in with your whole experience and just add to the atmosphere and to the mood and kind of intensify whatever the feeling that you're trying, that whatever the filmmaker is trying to communicate for you to feel on the screen. And I think it really excels at that. I will say... Um, 
the the Science of the Lambs one, while it is beautiful and, you know, very kind of kind of terrifying and keeps you on edge and is is very powerful, I will say it is a little I don't want to say generic, but it's like you can take a lot of like similar films from the era and you if you listen to those scores, they are kind of similar in, you know, it's kind of the same thing where it's, it's establishing a mood and a tone. And while this one is, you know, exceptionally beautiful, it still kind of like falls into with other ones and gets a little like muddled. So, yeah. Okay. Real quick, uh, just something you said for you, Carter. Uh, uh, it's just, you say that like the best scores are the ones that like don't stand out. Like they're the ones that you're like, you don't go you're not like, oh, I like that part of the music. Yeah, for Roger Rabbit, you said, oh, there wasn't really any part of it that, like, you keep in your head or you come away, like, humming or something. So how do you kind of, like... I, I just thought it was interesting how you, like, you bring that up for Who Framed Roger Rabbit, but then not say the opposite for Silence of the Lambs. Well, I would say they kind of two two different things a little bit, because Roger Rabbit... It's very much like the music is used to, like, contextualize the scene. So it's like jazzy scene because this is a noir film. And with Silence of the Lambs, it's more like yes, the music is there and it's it's supplemental, but it's it's kind of it's adding to the overall like feeling and mood of the scene. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I think that I think what he's what Matt's <clears throat> getting at at least is that. Does that make it inherently better, or does it just say that those these scores serve two different purposes? I would just say that if you're looking at it from that factor, I would say Science of the Lands does it better to the point that it should be like like emphasized that it does it better. Um, I think that you could say that it's more detrimental to Who Framed Roger Rabbit that you don't that you can't hum and remember. Because, like, even Science of the Lambs, I can kind of hum and remember the main theme of it at the opening and at the close and at the dramatic parts. But overall, when you're, like, in a scene, the music's not, like, coming right at you, sticking out at you, because it's all so woven carefully together in a scene. Okay. I was, okay yeah. like, that, that, that wasn't yeah. anything for or against anything. I was, I was just yeah. curious about your thought process on... Yeah. yeah. If was, that, does, that, does that make sense? Like, I, like, in, I get in, what you're in, getting in, at. Yeah, I think I get what you're getting at. We might have to have a little more discussion later on but uh yeah kind, kind of bouncing off uh, carter here uh i love the basement theme just like the music that's going on in the basement just because i think just because i'm kind of into like that just kind of like droning and ambient kind of stuff and you just have like the oh god I, like i don't know but it's just kind of like that like metallic just kind of like humming rumbling yeah, sound that like exactly. just goes on for like I saw like 30 seconds or something like list like listening to these scores i remember just like everything just kind of like went silent i'm like oh did did my phone just crap out or what then i turned it up and it's just kind of like that and i'm kind of like oh, oh oh music score how about that and so i really liked that but uh my yeah my one kind of i guess complaint about the score of science of the lambs is kind of like carter said like not not generic because like it's like it's beautiful it's haunting but sitting there listening to it like it like it kind of like each track kind of sounds each track sounds very similar but i think that comes with like trying to fit the tone so like i like like this isn't me trying to like dig at the film or anything this is me saying that like i couldn't tell any of the tracks apart just because it was like they, they they just all sound so similar. The only spots that I can remember actually sounding very different were during Lecter's escape, which makes sense because that's Hannibal Lecter escaping and eating people and such, and right. the basement, just because those those two sounded just so much different from everything mm-hmm. else. But like Carter says, like kind of yeah, it's like you can kind of see similarities that would share with other like movies and thrillers of that time period, and yeah, it's just. It it just kind of felt like one track kind of blended into another, and I had to like, if it wasn't for ads popping up on my phone, I honestly kind of wouldn't have known that some tracks ended where they did. But like again, that's not to say that it's like it's 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 haunting, like it's great, like we like I put that on if we ever play Murder in the Dark again. Yeah. But it's just after a while. Right. right. Yeah, and I think um, just to um, just to speak a little on that. Um, not to you know change your opinion or whatever because of 
of course, like it, um, it's totally uh, y'all's opinion on it. Um, I think one thing that sets it apart from those other movies is I think um, I think it's I think other movies do it because it's horrifying. But I think what Howard Shore does is like he does it because it's it's a horrifying and kind of haunting sound. But I think it's also very um, real, or applicable to uh, a story that has like a Hannibal Lecter character. Like I feel there's other ways to have haunting and terrifying um, sounds. And I think in this particular score, the droning and the eeriness and all of that is very um, applicable to Hannibal Lecter because he's so calculative in how he picks people apart and like tortures Clarice and um, you, the whole movie never, you never feel like a bit of danger or not, not you feel a bit of danger <laughs> constantly is what I'm trying to be. You never feel a bit of safety. There you um, go. Uh, and so it's the music kind of you know uh stays the same or stays constant and doesn't change much um but i think that's emblematic to the the story and um also i uh there was t uh talks with like how jonathan dem the director like wanted that he wanted mm -hmm. um he wanted score that kind of didn't stand out but just kept the mood and tone or whatever so um, uh, Howard Shore kind of played to his, to his his wants, and I think he did pretty well. Yeah. Um, so I was I was all first of all the main title is incredible. I can just listening yes. to it, I can picture the beginning of the film already. Um, I was going to say what Brett said again that like each song flows so seamlessly from one to the other that and it's so great. Like it does create a mood for the entire thing, but because of that as a whole. I had trouble with it just kind of blending into the background of whatever I was doing while I was listening. And, but what I will say is, I, I was already, you know, pull it out and say, this, this score gets boring. I'd rather focus on something else. I was all ready to write that down in my notes and be like, you know, this is my big take against it or whatever. But then while I was listening to it, uh, someone opened a door and it creaked a little bit and it scared the crap out of me <laughs> and I was like okay never mind it creates a mood the entire time like I was I was so ready to write it off as you know it's boring it's one note it's a little generic or whatever but like that happened and I was like oh it made my real life feel like I was in danger like <laughs> yeah exactly it's it, it it totally just changes the feeling of the of the air around you. You, yeah. you, you can't just you can't get everything's away from a little you. more tense when exactly. you're listening to it, and it just gets tightened and tightened all the way up mm -hmm. to the Lect Lecter escapes track and stuff. And I will admit and say to you guys that I think this is um, a good example of a score that is best listened to while watching yeah. the movie. Yeah. This is yeah, that, that that was what I like listening to. I was kind of like. There's like no bigger disservice you can do to this music than watching it without the movie because they are very because similar to like talking about like production design and how kind of like the production design is net 100 percent without the lighting and such whereas I feel like the score and the movie are net 100 percent without the other and so it's kind of like that's yeah like yeah of which, the of the yeah. of the, the the scores we're talking about I think this is the one where you most not necessarily can't listen to on its mm -hmm. own, but it is so much, it's a much better experience. Yeah, to get the full effect of it, yeah. And I was going to clarify when I was talking earlier about like a score standing out, like when you're watching a movie and a score stands mm -hmm. out versus not, that's what I mean. Is like movies that, that are like, it's better to listen to like while viewing the movie than it would be on its own. Like if you come out of a movie and you're like, oh, the score is the best part, like that usually speaks more about the movie than it does about the score kind of thing or like if the score really stands out for you to you for some reason because you can have like a really good score that's fantastic that can stand on its own but also kind of blends in and flows with the movie yeah if that makes sense what I will say yeah, I think we might just have to have a okay. more yeah. in-depth conversation after the podcast what I will say about this score and then I'm just gonna you know I think this will be my last thing about it yeah but I want to read something that Howard Shore said about it uh, which is just, I'm assuming he actually said it's from the Wikipedia page on <laughs> Silence of the Lambs, but he's quoted as saying, uh, I tried to write in a way that goes right into the fabric of the movie. Uh, I tried to make the music just fit in. When you watch the movie, you are not aware of the music. You get the feelings from all of the elements simultaneously. Lighting, cinematography, costumes, acting, music. Jonathan Dem was very specific about the music. 
And what I will say about all of that is of the elements that I think create the mood, the lighting, the cinematography, and the acting, I feel like all go so much, go above the music in my hierarchy of needs for what I want in Silence of the Lambs. So take okay. take from that what you will, but that's just okay. when talking about the score and when the composer is talking about how important all of the elements are, I think that like that really made me think about, you know, how important is the score to creating the mood? Okay. Um, I will it's, say... Once again, not the lowest, but yeah. I think the lighting, cinematography, and acting are all... I will repeat myself and say, the lambs may be silent, <laughs> but this music is not. A <laughs> hey, better laugh the uh, second time. <laughs> all right. No, it's because you repeated it. Yeah. Like, I heard you the first time, I was kind of like, haha, low-hanging fruit with like... I believed in it. Do it one more time. Rule of threes. <laughs> no, right. please don't. The no. slams may be silent, uh, but the music is not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that oh, was a good one. Uh, that's, wow. what I, that's what I needed. Quite the knee slapper. <laughs> that's what I needed. And with that uh, momentum, I think it's best that we move on to RoboCop. Okay, let's move on to RoboCop. All right, so we got the RoboCop score composed by Basil Polidorus. That's how you say it. That's how I think you say it. Okay. <laughs> Are you really sure it's not Basil? Basil. Whatever. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> talking about scores that perfectly like go alongside like the tone and theme of a movie. Uh, you'd think the score for RoboCop in an 80s sci-fi action satire, you think the score would just kind of be kind of forgettable and just lackluster but i i like i think the score for robocop is great all the scores here are great but uh, what i really love about the score for robocop is just how like all at every any given moment in the score just like all the music all the instruments perfectly encapsulate like the theme of like man versus machine throughout the entire thing because uh whenever Whenever it's like the music from a scene with Alex Murphy, you have all the string instruments for whenever he's doing his thing. But then you also have, then you have like all the like louder, more brass and wind sounds for almost everybody else. But then you also have like the synth just constantly in the background, just constantly kind of like undermining and like interrupting things. Just and then just to show that like oh yeah, like the machine. The machinery aspect is there. The technology is there in the background. And then when he becomes RoboCop, it's the strings then just go secondary to the synth and the brass and all like the more like metallic sounds, like the chimes and bells and percussion and cymbals, just the whole time until towards the very end when Alex Murphy rediscovers his humanity and kind of remembers who he is, remembers his family. And then the strings and synth kind of start working together, bouncing off of each other. And it's not until the very end where they finally kind of like merge. And so I just, I just love how it just takes the theme of the movie and just puts it all into the score like that. And then even, even some of the satire gets thrown in there because at the very beginning, uh, like right before the title punch, uh, you get like the slow build up. You hear like the synth phasing in and out. Then everything just swells up and the RoboCop title comes up, but then that's interrupted immediately and segues beautifully into like the newscast music, which is already kind of, kind of like, Oh yes, we're watching RoboCop. But first, like here's some messages. Like first the newscast, which is, vi- is that the silent phone? Like, yeah, exactly. I love that. Cause that's how the, like the movie starts is like RoboCop, but first the news and like, and that goes on throughout the movie. It's kind of like RoboCop, but first like here's some quick messages and stuff like that. So I love how it does that. And then they, it's just the instruments that are chosen for the different pieces for what's going on. Like, uh, oh shoot, what, which is it, which is it? Oh, when uh, RoboCop, Alex Murphy, he's going back to his old home and he's getting the flashbacks of his family and the, the whole like, I remember them, but I can't feel them. That whole thing, you have like the oboe and like the double reed instruments to kind of play up like this, dreamlike aspect to really get you in his head in his mental state and when he's like remembering everything they actually have like a choir start singing and harmonizing and that's the only time in the movie where you have like an actual human voice as part of the score and just really shows you kind of like oh like alex murphy is coming back he is not just robocop and then even alex murphy's theme 
just that gets played around with so much it gets drawn out, distorted. It gets whatever music it's played with gets changed just based on Alex Murphy's situation and how he is going through the movie. Just when he's fighting Ed Two Hundred Nine, there's just all the loud, just harsh, sharp brass sounds. Gets interrupted super briefly by the Alex Murphy theme, but then he starts losing the fight, and then it cuts right back to Ed Two Hundred Nine. But then every then that all kind of dies down. You get some more of like the light synth tones. It's kind of like oh yeah, like Ed Two Hundred Nine fell down the stairs, but RoboCop is still like very badly beaten up, and I just love how well just. Mr. Polidorus, Polidorus, I'm so sorry, Basil, Basil, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I love you, and I'm so sorry, but I just love how he just uses the music to just perfectly encapsulate and just, uh, God, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but how he just perfectly uses everything to just totally back up the themes of the movie through the music, and I just, yeah, it's, I, yeah. <laughs> I think this for this score, um, uh, I think, and this is not the only thing, the parameter and the only uh, uh, rubric that I'm judging these scores. But I think with this in particular, it was the most fun I had listening to. <laughs> I really was like writing the score well um, on my way to on my way to school and stuff. Um, I am I mark out and I am like a special fan of auxiliary percussion mm-hmm. probably because I was in pit and in auxiliary percussion <laughs> in high school or whatever but when they like busted out the xylophone for the news thing <laughs> and then they had a bunch of uh, like chimes going off in yeah. like the middle well, one well, of the middle tracks um, that, that's when uh, Murphy is dying and the doctors are operating on him it starts with like the winds and the strings but then like it slowly becomes like more synth more like the chimes bells and like exactly. the cymbal roll at the end with the synth just yeah, the symbol the synth role. rise, and it's just kind of like, oh, like, he is the machine now. Yeah, and the glockenspiel too. Yeah, like the it, glockenspiel. That's what it is. Yeah, and all of that, just yeah, exactly. Like you, you feel the the metallic nature just yeah. from the like metallic instruments that's going about with it, and it's uh, it, it's really fun. It's I, uh, it just it nails the the genre itself and um, the genre that it's that it is and. I just, yeah, I had a really, a really great time um, listening to this and getting, like, that that metallic music was really, was really fun, really cool to listen to. I, uh, I also love this soundtrack. I'm going to say that about all of them, but I, I do, I love the soundtrack. <laughs> um, I agree with Phoenix. Uh, listening to it, it was a lot of fun. It's a very fun, you know, score. It, it, it moves along and it's got, you know, it's got a good, diverse you know, music between the the newscasts and, you know, the serious moments and the action and all that. Um, I think the score's biggest strength, and you touched on it, is that that kind of metatextual, like, the fact that he brings in, like, synth and and different sounds and mm-hmm. w- contrasts it with the, the strings to kind of show that man versus machine relationship that is very present in the score. I think that's it's probably its greatest strength if you're looking at it from you know, a, a compositional angle. Um, I think it works very well in the movie. I think, um, I think it is a little, it, it kind of falls into that trap of like generic eighties action music. I think a little bit, um, not, I don't think to an insane degree, like it's indistinguishable because Robocop definitely has a theme. It's like the Robocop theme. Um, but I do think it, it does have a little bit of that, but that's really my only qualm with it. Um, other than that, I, I mean, I really enjoy it. It's very fun. It, it uh, is very fun. It should, yeah, it's yeah. a lot of fun. And I, I'll, um, I'll, I guess, throw out my, my qualm since I, I forgot to mention that. Um, that's, that's okay. <laughs> you don't have to do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, no. um, I think my biggest qualm is, personally, I feel like the tracks are can be inconsistent but only because and i that's why i'm hesitant to even call it a qualm only because i feel like some tracks are very stand out and great and then followed by those tracks are tracks that are not necessarily as great maybe just like suitable and i think for that reason i'm just like oh this track is whatever or whatever and it keeps going and i because i remember listening to the soundtrack and um earlier and just being so into it and then a, a track would end and another one would start and then I would 
kind of have that like, oh, okay, when's the next one going to come on or whatever. And then another one would come soon and I would be very into it. Um, so I think personally, I, it has some inconsistencies. Um, but that also might be just, um, you know, it serves best like the big parts of the movie and you know there's not all big parts mm-hmm. in the movie cuz it's a it's a movie it's got to have like ebb and flow um so i'm i don't know if i would consider it too big of a complaint but i can't i, I definitely had that feeling of like these tracks could be um more constantly good than yeah, have some, so so much peaks and valleys that, that that's fair and I, I see what you're saying i wonder if that's kind of like similar to like what was said about Silence of the Lambs, where it's kind of like, like that kind of like the ebb and flow of it. It's like it just really matches up really well with the movie, and it's kind of like, it it's like kind of doing it to serve its to itself, kind of only listening to it without watching it. I wonder if it's like, I wonder if it could be that kind of thing. Yeah, and I'm, get, like, I, I'm I, getting, I'm getting, I'm getting the vibe of that. I think. Yeah, because like I like listening to it again too. I'm kind of like I love this score, but it's kind of like yeah, you go from like the da 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 to like the much more subdued kind of thing. It's kind of like oh well, they're going from the whole like factory shootout to like Murphy just kind of like thinking about his life and everything. So it's kind of like yeah, there is that ebb and flow, but it kind of like matches what's going on, not unlike Silence of the Lambs in that kind of regard. Yeah, and I see that. So. I feel so bad because you guys are all so jazzed about this, and I just don't feel this. I don't feel Here this score. Here we go. This, and I don't like this. Is this is honestly so hard for me because I, I just didn't vibe with it. Like I don't know what to tell you. Like it's it's not like I have qualms about like oh I think this is bad or whatever. This was just for me one of my one of the least enjoyable like parts in this playlist, and I. I mean, I can tell you like what I wrote down. I said the main title is really good. I love that build to the RoboCop theme, and I do love that they play with that RoboCop th- theme throughout the whole thing. I think it does do a great job of doing the man versus machine motif. But aside from a few standouts, I really just didn't feel like this score was that memorable for me. Um, it's there's a lot of really short tracks on here that I felt like didn't have enough time to develop and become more memorable. And maybe that's what Phoenix is talking about with, like, some of the, just, the flow is off there. But, for the most part, like, I just, (laughs) you guys are all so amped about it, and I I will take your word for it, but it's just one of those things that, like, and much like my personal opinions on RoboCop, I think it's a perfectly good film. It's just, it's not as great as, I don't think it's as great as a lot of other people, especially Brett thing. (laughs) Yeah, and if you, is, like, if you have a problem with it, you don't have to take our word for it. Yeah. You, you can just say you have a problem I mean, with I it. I don't even know if I have real standout problems with it. It's well, just yeah, it's too, very yeah. one note for me. It's not um, very, like... Just to uh, clarify, what um, when you say you, you weren't vibing with it, is it like you just found it like boring? Or? Yeah, I just, it, was, it was the one that I felt like I, the most... of Even with Silence and Lambs, where I felt like it blended into the background, Robocop was the one where I felt the most like I was just like okay and how far oh we're only like five tracks in like okay i feel like this has been going on for hours right right. and some of the and you know the first five tracks are only probably a total of seven minutes long like yeah and so i don't know it it didn't hit me right maybe another time maybe with the film with it it works better but just sitting down listening to it all the way through it just wasn't vibing with me and that's all i can really say about it like i I understand there are good things about it. I don't have anything that's necessarily like, I think this is horrible. It's just, of the ones, it's the ones that one I had the least to say about, I think. Yeah. Right. Do you have any more to say on it, Brett? Uh, I don't know why I can say that it hasn't already been covered by you, Carter, and myself. And if Robbie didn't vibe with it, then, like, that's okay. Like, it happens. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, other than that, just yeah, I just love how it just perfectly like gets the theme of the movie across, and just like just listening to it without even watching the movie, you can tell it's kind of like okay, yeah. There's a lot of elements at play. There are a lot of things kind of like combating each other and like undercutting each other, but then eventually kind of like coming together in some kind of some kind of harmony. So like, yeah, I just I love that. I just really love how he uses synth without it being just, like, yeah. in your face and, like, falling into the trap of just, like, oh, like, 80 synth. And just, like, oh, here's a bunch of synth that just kind of, like, cover up to, like, just make it, like, fun and, like, crazy rather than actually have it, like, be, like, 
a composition and be meaningful. And so I just really like how he just kind of like takes synth and like kind of like doesn't let it fall into like the pitfalls and genericness that like 80s like synth pop movies have yeah. if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. For it sure. definitely does a good mm-hmm. job of that. All right. Carter Spilliards. Glad we could save the best for last. What can I say? Oh, did, so did oh we wow, just, Carter, did, did Carter we your disqual- microphone's the, muted. Oh, just, no. Did we disqualify the Princess oh, no. Brown? The Robocop was the last what? one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dang. I guess I'll just leave then. No, the Princess Bride, guys. You guys, know? come yeah. on, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, She's I ab- a bride. I absolutely and love the prince. princess. And the princess. I absolutely love the score uh, from Mark Knopf- Knopfler. Knopfler of Dire Straits. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, really? Did yes. not know that. Yes. Yes. Guitarist and lead um, singer of Dire Straits. He was. He worked with um, Rob Reiner on This Is Final Tap, and he got him from This Is Final Tap to work on Princess Bride. But they never actually I, met in person when I was yeah, reading about it. Something like that. Very cool. I love This Is Final Tap. Um, I yeah. also do too. I. <laughs> Yeah, I absolutely love the score. I think it's got that kind of, it nails, as we were talking about, it nails the tone of the movie and the mood in the score. It's like this, you know, dreamy, pastoral, romantic, very, like, fun, quirky, but it's also got the medieval in there because it's, like, fairy tale, you know, medieval storybook kind of thing. But then it's also, like, synth-heavy and it's got acoustics, and like the synth and the acoustics kind of go with that. It's almost kind of like Saturday morning cartoon a little bit in that kind of like playful, like fun manner, which I just absolutely love. Um, there's, I mean, Storybook Love is... Storybook Love is amazing. Is amazing. It was actually nominated for Best Original Song at the Academy Awards. Um, and that kind of that same theme that goes through like the Once Upon a Time and the the ending, the Happily Ever After and the final track. Um Cliffs of Insanity, like any of the themes with uh, whenever it's like the the traveling crew, like mm-hmm. Fezig and Inigo and, and them doing stuff, and it's very kind of like it's it, the the tone of the music kind of very much fits with the characters, you know, be kind of like kind of goofy music with the goofy character kind of thing, and it I think it it all really fits very well together, and I think it's it's absolutely lovely, and it's got a very like strong central theme that can that you can hum really easily. It does. Would you like to hum it? Please, <laughs> since I don't remember. <laughs> Keep going? Wow. Enchanting. I, I just wanted to make sure that got picked up. <laughs> yeah, but, maybe. Um, I, I want to talk about this one first since I've been holding back on the last couple ones. I love this score so much. I, I had forgotten how much I loved it until I... Uh, start until I started listening to it again. I mean, just the acoustic guitar parts on you know one, the intro story, uh, Once Upon a Time storybook love everything from you know the Close of Insanity like you mentioned, which is so quirky and fits so well with the rest of the film, as well as you know the fire swamp and the ruins of unusual size. That theme is also very quirky, like the Cliffs of Insanity. Ruins of unusual size. The rodents. I don't believe they exist. You know, <laughs> you're not here. Remember that, Carter? You're not here. Um, I'm so the glad. The sword fight music is so good. Can we talk? That was, I think, yeah, yeah. of the ones that, like, when I was researching it, it was one that I didn't see getting a lot of praise, but I love listening to that music. Oh, I love it. And especially the moment in the movie, because it mm-hmm. very much, you feel like the passion with, you know, Inigo Montoya when he's fighting, and are you talking about the... The, the sword fight between him and Wesley. No. Oh, and him and Wesley, that also is Not revenge, good. but the sword fight. I was talking about revenge, which... That like that kind of culmination with the music and when he's fighting, I really love. But yes, also the sword fight music with that because like the rhythm of the music mm-hmm. it goes with the rhythm of the well, sword yeah. fight. When they're hitting and they're going yeah. da, 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 like the music's yeah. also going along with that. Yeah, it's which bouncing I think with them serves it very well. You know, it, it sits, it fits very well with their fencing and their. Yes. You know, it's so good. I love that. This is a score that I think perfectly complements its uh, film without you know either overdoing it or becoming you know more becoming more of a cultural touchstone than the movie itself you know sometimes you think of like everyone knows the star wars theme but even people that don't see star wars but like this is a film this is a score that really complements its movie without overtaking it without you know so i think that does actually the fact that it works so well for it 
And Mark Knopfler, so great. Yeah. I mean, just does a fantastic job, knocks it out of the park with this one. I my only qualms with it are that at times like it's maybe a little too generic for the scene it's got, but the times when it really is so tailored to what's going on and it's so on beat, I think that really outweighs my distaste for some of the times where it just maybe phones it in on for a track or something. Yeah, this is so this is why I wanted to go back to when I, I originally brought it up a new frame Roger Rabbit. I feel like this movie has a, uh, in terms of the score, has a similar purpose in that it kind of wants to capture a familiar kind of a familiar sound and a familiar, um, uh, a familiar score with other kind of fairy tale, dreamland, romantic um, genres. I want to reiterate and say that I think the score is good. I think all of the scores we have are good. Again, I keep saying that, but this I will say that this is the first one where I felt like I felt like it could have been a little better especially the first half I thought this was a very like it was strong on the back end like I agree Storybook of Love is great I agree um, the sword fight's great Cliff and Sandy's great and Fire Swamp I think, oh, I like you, I think you mentioned those or Fire whatever. Swamp's good Revenge is good I didn't mention Friends the Friends song is also very good which I think is yeah. still pretty early on in the... I was going to say, it's yeah. not a terribly long score to begin yeah. with. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it's that's true. But I feel like it's still also... I mean, it's similar to how my feelings of Robocop, or Robocop, I felt like there was a lot of uh, peaks and valleys. Except with this one, I feel like I really was not into the beginning, the first half. Not that I wasn't into it, but I was... I kept listening to it thinking... They could have nailed this better. They could have like, I I was expecting more mandolin or more not or um, maybe a, like more harp or some other kind of like dreamy fairy tale type like a, like a loo. nods. Yeah, like a loo. Yeah. Um, and it just uh, it just felt a little too easy. Like, um, like it it definitely gets what it's going for, but it I feel like it could have been improved, especially with um, uh, where is that? Morning Ride. I think Morning Ride and um uh is like a song where it you know like it's good, it's serviceable. I feel like is the right word to say it works, but it doesn't work as strong as I think it could be. And I would say that's maybe my biggest complaint with this is like I think it's finishes strong the score. Um Storybook of Love is fantastic. Um but I think that when it tries to go for more, um, for more kind of spoofs or homages, um, with Who Framed Roger Rabbit, my problem was that I felt like it was just trying to replicate. With Princess Bride, I feel like that it's not um, replicating ev- well enough. I think it's m- missing certain instruments, certain feelings, and it, I think there could have been more tracks or maybe more attention to the f- first tracks. In my opinion. Well, and I think there might actually be. There's, I think there's more music. It's just what's on the actual album. Yeah, but that's what we're going off. That's of. true. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah. So I would just say, like, keep that in mind. That there is probably more music. It's just not necessarily what was put on the soundtrack. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna bounce off of Phoenix here. Uh, like, yeah, like I, again, haven't seen Princess Bride since seventh grade. So I, it's only been seven weeks for you to watch it, Brad. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Uh, yeah, I did not really remember the score. So listening to it, I was kind of like, okay, like, yeah, like I'm into this. But like, like Phoenix said, like at, from like when it started, I was kind of like, oh, like this is nice storybook fairy tale fantasy. And I was kind of like, okay, still fairy tale storybook fantasy, and everything kind of sounded the same. Then there was a uh, the Florian dance. Yeah, the Florian dance. I was kind of like, oh, hey, I, I like this. I'm into this. And, but that kind of like got a little repetitive even though it was only like a three four minute track I was kind it's of only like, a oh, minute and 37 oh, seconds is it? or no Go no ahead. it is three uh no it's a minute 33 seconds and 33 seconds see I, like, I I thought it felt like three minutes but like that that was good I like it but like Phoenix said I feel like the first half of it was very just kind of like not not repetitive but like very kind of like safe almost kind of generic and safe yeah like safe and then like yeah the second second half I was more into 
in like uh, like the whole sword fight mm-hmm. bit. Like I, I I was sitting there doing something else. And I was kind of like, wow. Like I feel like I feel like I'm like. I felt like I was listening to like something out of like one of the Legend of Zelda games. So I was kind of like, oh, what is this? It was like sword fight. You're like, it's like, the sword, sword fight. fight. I'm like, oh, yeah. cool, great. So like, yeah, it, it gets the fantasy feel down pat. But again, like Phoenix said, it was kind of like, it sounded like it kind of like, it could have been like from almost like a lot of other fantasy films. I'm like, okay, like this could be Ridley Scott's legend. This could be like the last unicorn or like a, uh, Bakshi's animated Hobbit Lord of the Rings movies. I'm kind of like, like, yeah, I just feel like the best stuff was in the second half. And I, I totally felt like all the different characters were there with all the different music. But yeah, it was just kind of like lacking something to really give it that like extra like, yes, like this is the like the Princess Bride stamp of fantasy storybook score music to it. Again, not not like I'm not saying it's bad. Because all the scores here are, for t- are fantastic. It's just... Yeah. Yeah. When you when it gets to be as good as the scores we are, we have to like you know nitpick and be as yeah. detailed mm-hmm. as possible. Or otherwise, we won't come with a decision. Yeah the, o- yeah. the only thing I can say in defense of when you're saying like first half is better than the second half is... First of all, like I said earlier, it's not a very long score. So it's kind of difficult to separate mm-hmm. first and second half. When you talk about like Clefson and Sandy or Sword Fight, that's at the beginning of the movie. Like the Sword Fight's not even like at the half point of the movie. Yeah, just yeah. Ba- based on the tracks. Uh, based yeah. on the track, the track listing, listing, you get to Clefson and Sandy at the halfway point. Yeah, and that's still at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. Um, Does the second half not have a lot of music? I, I think it's just repeated, and so they don't put it on the uh, soundtrack. Uh, See, I, I, yeah, I like feel... Like, floor and dance is used, like, almost every time, like, yeah. royalty That's what showing, I was saying, because like... what it is is I think it's just showcasing each of the main themes, and then they just repeat the themes in the movie. Okay. That's why it's not... See, I f- yeah, I feel like it's just kind of... Yeah. We're, we're just kind of, like, shooting ourselves in the foot talking about yeah. score without, like, watching the movie yeah. at the same time, because, like, again, like... Just for everything here with the ebb and the flow, the peaks and the valleys, highs and lows, like a lot of it is based on like what's happening yeah. in the movie at that time. And so like, yeah, yeah I, I know Cliffs of Insanity is towards the beginning of the movie, but based on the track listing, which like Phoenix said, is kind of what we're going off yeah, of. Yeah. Just have the first half, second half in regards to that. Yeah. yeah. Which is, you know, just kind of the pitfall of examining each of these situations, each of these challenges, you know, in a vacuum. Yeah. Rather yeah. Than, I would yeah. also like to add that you keep bringing up that the, the, the score is small, and I feel like that is makes it a little worse. Because well, if there's not that many tracks and they're, it's like kind of halved already to begin with, then it kind of makes it seem like the tracks that aren't as strong for me are just more prevalent in the film, in which case... I mean, I agree that they probably work better in the film, and I, you know, I've seen, I've seen the movie, and they, it's like, it complements the scenes well, but I, yeah, I, when you have such a, a small score, um, you kind of want, I think most of it, like, mo- you don't have enough room to have as many like uh not disappointing but songs that could be better and yeah. i think that's why you're not faulting I, it for having a shorter score no okay i'm just saying that when it when you have a shorter score the 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 you the want song, more more standout tracks not standout well, or but but better overall not even that just, just the songs that disappoint stand out more oh okay mm-hmm. because there's not as much yeah there's not as material much material to there's, material there's not to other stuff with. to like compensate yeah. and cushion it yeah we're yeah. only looking at a small amount so I have to be okay. like oh yeah. this yeah. yeah that's fair you, you also have to admit, some of this movie has stretches where you know it has no score because yeah. it's in the bedroom with the grandfather reading to baby Fred Savage and yeah so I mean some of those themes are just repeated in order to reestablish the setting you know yeah, I will say that there are moments where the music's used, but even the stuff that you guys find a little more boring is used to great effect in the film. But that's yeah. obviously not what we're examining. We're talking about soundtrack albums here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and really. I, yeah, and I do want to again say that like I'm only being this nitpicky with it because we're down to the final four. Mm-hmm. It would be so hard to have make come up with a decision if we weren't so nitpicky and detailed at this point. Yeah. Yep. Um, if this were like you know. Out of twelve, 
I could, you know, be less harsh about stuff because there's more Out things 12, to judge. Out of 12, we wouldn't remember what any of the scores <laughs> exactly. were. Exactly. <laughs> Which is but, why we waited so long for yeah. the final score mm-hmm. for. When you look at a, when you look at a set of movies and you think all of them are great, you're going to have to find reasons why yeah. some are better. Yeah. Okay. Right. And, ju- and just, right. just, just real quick, just for me, because mm-hmm. listening to it, I, I don't recall hearing synth, and I'm, I'm not saying like th- this isn't to argue for or against. Mm-hmm. This is just for me personally. Like, which which tracks are more synth heavy? All, all of them. It's, all, it's, it's, it's a lot of synth pads. Yeah, so it's a lot say. of the background. Yeah. Like, oh, just okay. Because I'm, I'm trying to be hearing like a lot of like the pastoral and yeah. like yeah, like a lot of like the like woodwind I, kind of instruments. I, I I didn't recall hearing a whole lot of synth, but then again. I had also listened to RoboCop yeah. one soundtrack earlier, so yeah. I guess I would. So I guess I'm kind of in the mindset yeah. of like. Because I was gonna say, I think Mr. the whole, the whole okay, thing so was that, recorded that's, with. I think okay, only that, synth that, just, guitar. Uh, like, you can look at the like the. Okay, yeah, yeah the, like, the, like, I, only I, synth I, I, I guitar mean, and like one other instrument. Yeah, I, I didn't mean for guitars, this to turn keyboards, into a thing. Just, and there's vo- there's a vocal yeah, credit. Yeah, but that's okay, it. so I, I might have to go back and listen with a different mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it was cool. Just all right. Because you're kind of like, oh, it's so synth heavy. I was like, I'm like. Synth heavy. It's a lot of did, did synthesized the, like, instruments, not necessarily okay. your yeah, not okay, necessarily yeah. like your standard. <laughs> For a second, I was kind of like, did I listen to the wrong Prince's? Not like a Roland, you know, like <laughs> yeah, no, no, no not yeah, your yeah, standard yeah, Akai yeah. MIDI keyboard like <laughs> synth. You go to like YouTube and, and you're like, ah, Princess Frog. Do <laughs> 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 we want to do winners and then voting off? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So Carter was gesturing at which direction we were going to go. All right, let's do it. Um. So we'll start off with winners. Um, my winner this week, and I, I said it earlier and I'm going to say it again. Um, I just thought that this score on its own was the best score we had. I think it was the most, you know, well put together, the most beautiful. And so my winner this week is Silence of the Lambs. Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to be tacky. (laughs) Sorry, everybody. I'm going to choose RoboCop just because... I don't know, it's just kind of like, I've heard it before, but just like, actually like listening to it with a fine tooth comb and just like, really like sitting down and thinking about it. And I was just kind of like, wow, like this isn't just like fun and like goofy and satirical. Like this is actually like, there's a lot of heart put into this and just, yeah, I was just kind of like, and I never realized how he's kind of like, oh, this thing is very synth heavy, but without, yeah, what I've already said about the synth. And so, yeah, sorry to be tacky, everybody. You know... When we started at the at week one, I did not think I would pick my favorites to be RoboCop this much, but <laughs> I'm picking RoboCop again, and now I'm questioning. I'm like, I've always liked RoboCop, but do I love RoboCop? <laughs> because, I yeah, I think the score is so good. Like, I think it's it was super enjoyable, super fun. I think it nails the motifs and, um, and is just yeah like. The yeah, I think it's the best on its own and the best, you know, complemented with them with them or uh, like it's strength. It's strong in both. I should say maybe not the best at both, but it's super strong <laughs> um, on its own and super strong complementing with the movie. And I think that just you know speaks volumes. So uh, and I I am so into auxiliary percussion and this <laughs> score has a lot of it. So I'm going with Robocop. Thank you. All right, I gotta pick my favorite, and that is I'm gonna be tacky. Who Framed Roger Rabbit? It's got such a good uh, Alan Silvestri score. I, you know, gushed about it for five minutes at the beginning. I don't know what more I can say about it. It's just so much fun. I think it fits the film so well. And even in parts where it just, or Phoenix thinks that it, like, it replicates a little too much, I think is part of the charm of the movie. I think it does just as good of a job as blending the noir and cartoon elements as the rest of the film does. Love that soundtrack. Was not expecting to love it as much as I did. <laughs> Just been stuck in my head all day. Are we getting... Now, oh, now it's back to me. Back to, to you to do. I mean, we all kind of knew which one my least favorite was. I said it oh. before. RoboCop's my least favorite. I'm, I can't... It, like I said, I just didn't vibe with it. It's not fun for me. Not like it's torture, but like it just... It was my least favorite. And at this point, like I just didn't have room for, you know, saying, hey... I didn't like this, you know? Yeah. I got, I got to pick. I got to vote for that. <sighs> That's fair. Phoenix That's the Roller, fair. who's leaving the island? I think mine's obvious, too. I'm going Princess Bride. I, I think all of the our scores are great, and I think all of them have problems, but I just... I didn't love the Princess Bride score as much as I just... It, it's just a matter of fact. I didn't love the Princess Bride score as much as the others. Just plain and simple. I, I thought it was... I thought the, ha- the second half was really great... 
the first half just didn't win me over. And um, when looking at the other scores, I, I, I would pick that last. So it's, it, it feels bad, but just got to go with it. What are you going to do? I'm also voting for the Princess Bride just because <laughs> basically everything that I've already said. I'm sorry, Carter. Uh, just it felt just at times it just felt a little too too generic and I found myself thinking it could fit to other fantasy movies a little too easily and just uh, yeah I, I don't know what I can say that hasn't already been said uh, so my vote's for The Princess Bride I'm sorry don't hate me y'all aren't gonna see this coming split the vote my vote this week is for The Silence of the Lambs what? Whoa! Let me explain. How is it your what? favorite and what? your vote off? Why did you wait for me to take a drink of water? I was about to spit that out all over the mics. <laughs> I, uh... Explain, wait, I feel like this episode's me... gone long already. Okay, go. Yeah, go. Just, okay. Stop, stop. <laughs> just let me, go. Let me explain. So, yes, personally, you know, Silence of the Lambs is my personal favorite score. But I think in terms of compared to the other scores and how the scores are used within their own film, I think Silence of the Lambs is actually the weakest. So, by simple majority, Princess Bride is out. It's off the island. But I did want to explain my off vote. Off the moon. Off the off moon. Off of the moon. The moon island. Off the moon island. But I just wanted to explain myself. That is wild. What a... <laughs> what a... Wow. <laughs> this is my recommendation is that Carter understand what a winner and a loser is, but... <laughs> that, yeah, I'm I'm so taken aghast. I have oh no idea what to even. I feel like that's some weird strategy. I feel like you're already going rogue, even without any movie, like <laughs> without not, any movies yeah, left. Carter, you're He's already now losing has, your mind. He has nothing to lose now. So he set up the <laughs> he wild can do card. Whatever he He's wants. He's just gonna pop shots <laughs> all the time. Pot shots. He started now. He knew. <laughs> All right. Oh god, we have such a we have such a weird group of movies now. I know. Like, what Who named Roger, Roger Rabbit? Rabbit. So Roger Silence, of the, the Silence of the Lambs. Like, oh, what? who knew it'd come down to this? These like, three. I I honestly never envisioned RoboCop getting this far. I honestly never I envisioned thought, RoboCop getting this far. I thought RoboCop would be like the first movie we voted off. All right. Anyway, All right. our new wild card, Carter Spilliard, yes. me. Promo yourself. All right. Yes, you can follow me something. on Twitter at C A Spillers. Like spill something in your yard and add an S. Um, this week I'm recommending. What did I see? Um, oh, we watched all of the Marvel movies. Um, if you we didn't did. see on our Twitter, we live tweeted watching all the MCU movies. Three of us did. So uh, let me highly <laughs> recommend um, D- the DC film Man of Steel. <laughs> okay. Are you just I'm pulling more, you, some more wild cards? <laughs> he's he's popping shots, losing his mind already. That this is this going forward is going to be Carter Carter chaos. He's just going to like go insane and just we got we got to have a supplemental podcast. Yeah, it's going to get scary. <laughs> okay, uh, you find me on Snapchat Brett J H N S N number one. Uh, I post reviews of movies every single day. Thumbs up, thumbs down. If you agree, disagree, want to know more, let me know. Uh, I am going to recommend, uh, yeah, Carter said, we, uh, we marathoned every single Marvel movie back to back to back to back to back times 17. I'm going to recommend Captain America, the Winter Soldier. Very cool. I am at Bomb S Phoenix on Twitter. Follow me there. Hope you enjoy my tweets. Uh, excuse me. I did not watch, excuse me again. I did not watch, uh, the Mar- Marvel Marathon because I wanted to have a weekend. So instead, what I watched was the season premiere of Barry, the HBO show starring Bill Hader. And it's good. I liked it. And I'm going to go forward with it. I'm already going to say that it's a good show, even though it's one episode in. So, I really liked it. yeah. So, you know, maybe episodes, who knows how the season will go down the stretch, but I was into the first episode and you should check it out. I haven't checked it out yet, so I will. Uh, I, as always, am Robbie underscore DeShazer on both Twitter and Instagram, so go follow me there. I need more followers. I I love it. I need to be loved. Uh, My recommendation (laughs) for this week is uh, this little indie film by Wes Anderson called Isle of Dogs. Um, Mm. It's it's so good. I love it. (laughs) I love it to death. It's, It's a lot of fun. If you like dogs, go see it. 
If you like Wes Anderson, go see it. So Phoenix won't go see it. Nope. But hey, that's just the way uh, this works sometimes. And that is the nature of film fracas. Thank you for listening to another fantastic episode. Next week, well, join us when we we next week join us when we wheel Carter in on a Dolly Hannibal Lecter style mm-hmm. to keep him from lashing out at us. Yep. Uh, Stay tune tuned. in to see if our episodes get even longer oh, with less goodness. movies. Still, again. <laughs> All right, that's been the episode. We'll see you again next week. Thank you Bye-bye. for listening. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Film Fracas. We know there are a lot of shows on the web, and we are so glad you took the time to listen to ours. Thank you, Brett Johnson, Robbie DeShazer, and Phoenix Arola for helping to write and produce each episode of the show. There's no team behind Film Fracas, it's just us, so consider giving us a five-star review wherever you listen. It really does help get the word out. You can follow the show on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, at Film Fracas. Once again, thanks for listening, and we can't wait for you to hear our next episode.